Irvin, thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. So now that you've got a, a sense from Evan of what the landscape is for the next two days, you're obviously going to drill down into each of the, the bits of that uh, landscape that he showed you of business agility. My task is to just make sure that you don't stick with incremental thinking uh, as you get going. So I'm not here to give you another list of what might happen in the future. As you've heard, Business agility doesn't set a pathway for you uh, that says, here's the path, there's the place you've got to go to. Uh, it, it gives you tools to get there. One of the biggest tools you have is to not merely think of improving what you've already got, but to step back and actually reimagine what could be. And I think that if you reverse engineer your business from the future, if you put yourself 10 years, 20 years into the future and imagine what a company in your industry is going to need to look like, and then think backwards to, well, what can you do to start getting towards that now? I think that will set you up in a much better mindset than starting from the past. In other words, starting from this is what we've got at the moment, now how do we tweak a few things to take another step and another step? It, it might sound like a, 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 a silly little consultant's trick to just ask you to change the frame to the future rather than the past, but I honestly believe that it, it'll make all the difference for you. Uh, let me show you how to do it uh, and, and set you up so that when you're listening uh, to all the rest of the presentations over the next two days, you're using this future of work mindset to help you do it properly. This is the slide that's meant to get at least half of you rolling your eyes back in the head, okay? Because every conference you've been to in the last two years, since in fact uh, uh, it was a Schwab from the World Economic Forum at Davos about three years ago, came up with this label, Fourth Industrial Revolution, Every conference you've ever been to has got speakers speaking on the fourth industrial revolution. Um, I did scan the program for the next two days, and, and I'm glad that it's conspicuously absent. Uh, I've been to conferences where every second workshop is a fourth industrial revolution look at whatever. Um, and although it's become a cliche very, very quickly, I do still think, though, it's worth considering what this fourth industrial revolution is. I'm absolutely certain that uh, Soro Ramaphosa will use this phrase again in his State of the Nation. Either that or Wakanda again. Um, either one. Uh, it, it kind of it covers over a, a complete lack of actually knowing what you're talking about for most people. No, seriously, if, if you go to a conference and there's a speaker speaking on the fourth industrial revolution, be, be a little bit cheeky. Go to them beforehand and say, I'm just wanting to check whether I should come to your session or not. Are you speaking on the fourth industrial revolution, right? What was the second one? If you're going to talk about the fourth, you should at least know what the first three were, right? Okay, so just to make sure you're up to speed, quick his history lesson. The first industrial revolution began in 1712, when an Englishman called Thomas Newcomen invented the steam-driven pump. Okay? Uh, there are still uh, versions of it uh, rocking around. Uh, this is exactly what he invented. It was used in a Welsh coal mine, where they got water out of the coal mine and allowed the miners to dig deeper, faster, get more coal out of the mine, get more productivity of coal per hour per person, etc. Uh, within a couple of decades, this technology of, of steam driven and then ultimately oil and petrol and, and internal combustion engines, but this concept of, of a machine driving productivity had gone through every single industry. Uh, from uh, making of clothes to the printing of books from hospitals to transportation. Not a single industry was left untouched. And it was all remarkable except for the smog. And when you studied all of this at school, you just called this the Industrial Revolution. Uh, you didn't know it was the first, but there it is. Okay. 
The second industrial revolution began in the late 1800s, and there were two drivers for it. The first driver is probably best epitomized in Henry Ford's motor factory. The driver was productivity improvement again. Um, so productivity had kind of reached a peak with all the machines in place and all the technology in place. And then we realized that that was mainly because we had taken the machines and just replaced the people in the system. But we hadn't actually changed the system. And Henry Ford came along and he didn't invent any new technologies. He didn't invent the car. Uh, some Americans think he did, but he didn't. That was a, a, a Mr. Benz uh, who invented the car. Uh, he didn't invent any components of the car. Uh, what he did was he changed the way the car was made uh, by creating a continuous production line with specialized labor. Each person had 30 seconds to do whatever it was they had to do. Put the front wheel on, bolt the four bolts, step back. Put the front wheel on, bolt the four bolts, step back. Put the front wheel on, bolt the four It was magnificent work if you could get it. By the time he perfected this in 1922, he was producing one car every 32 seconds out of the back of his factory. If you're watching the, the video, uh, oh, I think we might have just passed it. The last piece of the video, uh, no, no, here we go, we come in, we put the chassis on and all the rest, and the last guy on the production line is a driver who hops in the car and he's got 30 seconds to get the car out of the front of the factory, otherwise the next car smashes into the back of him. Uh, so that's, that's pretty impressive, right, in terms of process efficiency and everything else. The second driver of the second industrial revolution was a new concept of human management. Uh, it's called scientific management. If you've ever done an MBA, you would have heard the name Frederick Taylor. Taylorism, scientific management, a number of different labels are used. But all of these said, we need to change the way we manage people. Now that we have all of this technology, we can't just keep using people the way we used to use them. We have to change that. So uh, Ford is a good example here. One weekend he was sitting at home and he thought, people who make our cars should be able to afford to buy them. So he did the calculation to work out how much you had to earn in order to afford a car. Uh, he then realized that the people in the factory didn't earn enough to own a car. So we went in, and, and this is all properly researched. This is not a fictional tale. This genuinely happened. He walked into work on a Monday morning and said to the financial team, please double the wages. And they did. With, by the end of the week, they had doubled wages. Very smart. Uh, he allowed people to not take the doubling of the wages in cash, but to take it in a car, which they then financed over five years and had to pay back. Um, so they basically, he gave them a free car, invented car financing, and the rest is history, as they say. But it was a mindset shift around management. Here's the key for you. If you're taking notes, you're going to need this sentence in about three minutes' time. The second industrial revolution was not about inventing new technologies. It was about taking the technologies that already existed and reimagining the world of work based on those new technologies. Does that make sense to you? So what was the third industrial revolution? Okay, just to get the ground rules going at the beginning of this two days, right? When the person on stage <laughs> finishes a sentence with, it's a thing that sort of is, is a round curly thing with a dot at the bottom and then just stares at you, okay? This is a, it's, it's a great concept. It's called a question. Um, it invites, and this is the interactive bit, okay? This is what I'm saying. Let me try that again. Okay, so what was the third industrial revolution? Covered it. Yes, exactly. Computing, IT, technology, all that good stuff. Uh, going all the way back to the 1950s, you're starting with mainframes, then you go to desktops, then laptops, then handhelds, and, and soon we'll have uh, integrated into our system computers. You go from uh, dial-up modems uh, all the way through to 1G, 2G, 3G, now we're getting to 5G, or Donald Trump recently said, why don't we just go to 11G? 
maybe because of numbers. Um, and, and we've got fiber and all that, that other good stuff. Um, and that's the third industrial revolution. Everything that goes along with the digital age. So what's the fourth industrial revolution? This mythical, magical concept we're supposed to talk about all the time, and it changes everything. What's the fourth industrial revolution? Artificial intelligence, machine learning, automation. These are all the things you'll hear about when you go to a fourth industrial revolution workshop, except they're all incorrect. Thank you, thank you. I gave you the answer three minutes ago. I told you to write it down. I even warned you you'd need it. So thank you for playing along with us. Whoever's giving out prizes, give that man a belt. Okay. Um, but in all seriousness, let's just go back to your answers, which are wrong. They are wrong answers. Um, your answers are wrong because why are these not the third industrial revolution? Exactly. These are third industrial revolution things. These are shiny technology toys that all of your teams, your companies, your whole supply chain, and all of your customers are all agog with, but know nothing about and don't know how to implement. So you go to conference after conference, talking about this stuff, thinking you're clever, and doing nothing with it. Because it's not the fourth industrial revolution. The fourth industrial revolution is not the shiny toys of technology. The fourth industrial revolution is taking the technologies that exist, by the way, without even needing to invent new technologies. We have plenty of stuff available to us already. You don't need some Google-level artificial intelligence machine taking up your whole basement before you can start using technology to help you do business process improvements and so on. I, in fact, hate the word AI because I think too many people then put AI in their head and they think, well, we don't have AI at our company because all I've got is a Windows 98 uh, desktop uh, on here and IT won't even let me plug a dongle in. Um, we don't need AI. What we need is IA. We need intelligent assistance in our system, and that might come in the form of an app. Uh, we don't need robotic automation. You've already got more computing power in the palm of your hand than anyone 10 years previously to us could even imagine would be in the hands of an individual. Imagine what NASA would have given for this thing 20 years ago. Imagine. And here it is in the palm of your hand, and you just call it a phone. Yeah? This is a supercomputer, but it is not AI, it is IA, intelligent assistance. Are you allowing your team, are you enabling your team to use it properly? Are you giving intelligent assistance to your team? Do, do you see what I'm saying? You can spend the next five years chasing technology shiny things and, and, and hoping to somehow get to this mythical fourth industrial revolution, or you can realize that the fourth industrial level, uh, revolution is nothing more or less than taking the tools you already have and reimagining how you might work given the fact that you now live in a digital revolution. Most of your businesses have done nothing more in the last 10 years then merely improve the speed and cost of the stuff you were doing. You haven't taken a blank piece of paper and say, now that we live in a digital age, what are we actually going to do? I don't want to knock our hosts this morning because I speak at conferences for a living, so I don't want people to stop doing conferences. And I, and I love it when a group like this puts together. I love it when people say, this is our first annual conference. It's like introducing my wife to people. I say, hi, I'm Graham, and this is my first wife, Jane. <laughs> okay. You know, it's a little bit bold, if you like, uh, about potential for the future. Um, so I love it. I love it when companies are bold enough to say, 
We're not just trying this out, boom, we're putting a stake in the ground. Except I don't think, and, and this is not knocking them, this is how we do conferences. But why do we do conferences like this? Why did we all make our way through traffic this morning? When I say all, I mean everyone was on the road this morning. I don't know if you had the same traffic problem I had. But why do we all go to a conference that starts at exactly the same time that everybody else starts? And by the way, we will finish the conference just in time this afternoon for you to get in the same traffic to go home. Why don't we start late or early, end late or early? Again, this is not a criticism. I'm just pointing out that it's so easy to just say, this is how it's done. It might be the best version of how it's done. I think this is a great version of how it's done. But we're all in the room. Where, where's the virtual reality? Why? I mean, I've already been in five countries this year already. Why? I'd love to be at home in my shorts with a nice smart top. You know how they do it in the news? Everything under the desk, just don't stand up, right? Um, you know, but you're sitting there with a camera. Why do I have to be flown in? Why do you all have to drag yourself here to do something you could just as easily do in front of your screen at home? One of the reasons, by the way, is the networking. Um, so that's something that's difficult to do in a virtual environment. So there are answers to that question. But I'm trying to get you to think that it's just too easy for us to say our job is to simply improve what we've already got, to do the best version of what we've always been doing. Whereas I wonder if the fourth industrial revolution doesn't ask a little bit more of us to reimagine from the future. Let me give you an example in, in case this isn't quite sitting with you. Let's take healthcare. I, I think this is a great example. I think we're going to see more change in the healthcare sector in the next 10 years than any other sector, and I think it's going to blow your mind. So a few months ago, I woke up, I was feeling a little bit sick, got a sort of chesty cough, sore throat. And this is what I do for a living. I speak for a living. So when my throat gets sore, I don't muck around. I'm not one of those South African men who just goes, I'll just take a Carenza. I'm sure I'll be fine. Uh, I'm, I'm much more of a naff. I'm straight to the doctor. Boom, sort me out, doc. So I head, head to the doctor. I sit. I wait in the waiting room. Eventually get to see the doctor. Uh, doctor has a look in my throat checks all the things he's supposed to check, and then says, look, I'm really glad you came in. Actually, this is a nasty thing. It's been going around. Uh, you wouldn't have actually done, you know, Karenza's not going to sort this one out, so scribble something on a piece of paper. Yeah, go and get this at the pharmacy. Uh, you know, it should be fine in about five days. Oh, excellent. Great result. So as I leave the, 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 the office, I say, thanks, Doc. That that's, was easy. And he said, no, oh, no, my, my pleasure. See you soon. I said, um, do you want to change what you've written on this piece of paper then? I mean, why am I going to see you soon? Surely, doctor, my best life is if I never see you again. We are not friends. I never want to see you again. No disrespect, of course, but that's the system. In fact, this is the point, right? We don't have a health care system. We have a sick care system. You only get in the system when you are already sick. And that got me thinking, wouldn't it be remarkable if we actually had a healthcare system? If one week before I got sick, I got a note from my doctor saying, hey, Graham, you're about to get sick. Here's how you can stop that. And then I began to think, is that even possible? And I realized, of course it's possible. I mean, we wear fitness trackers, right? All of us who are on discovery or momentum, we've got to get those 10,000 steps in every day. <laughs> Good luck today, right? Um, <laughs> by the way, I did a conference for Discovery last year, and, and, and one of their reps told me, no, 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 it's very simple, very simple. Uh, don't wear the fitness tracker. Put it in a Ziploc bag and tie it to your creepy crawly. <laughs> Apparently, that's 12,000 steps a day every day, guaranteed. Um, I don't know, just use it, don't use it, whatever. Um, but anyway, we've got these fitness trackers. Um, 
And these fitness trackers, at the moment, they sort of only look at your uh, heart rate and at your steps. But the next versions are literally the very next versions. Apple Watch 6 and other options are available, Fitbits and so on. The very next versions are going to include blood pressure, body temperature. Uh, our, Apple last year employed more than 20 healthcare professionals uh, into their Apple Watch team. Watch what happens. There will, there will be announcements in the next few weeks, uh, and, and you will see that these fitness trackers and wearable devices are going to take a step up dramatically uh, in, in the next uh, few months. Not years, months. So now you're collecting all of that data. Let's give that data to our doctor to analyze, right? It includes your sleep patterns. Uh, it could even uh, include your nutrition. Those of you who take photographs of all the food you eat, I don't understand it, but maybe you do. Give your doctor access to your Instagram account, whatever. Um, I say your doctor. Of course, I mean a supercomputer in your doctor's office. That's what I really mean. The second thing your doctor can do is to check Google every day. Not just randomly Google stuff, but Google have a system where they track medical information. Uh, anybody who types in a symptom, uh, you know, take a photograph, hey, I've got this rash on my skin, what is this, Google? Uh, Google track that, they geolocate it, and if they start to see people doing the same type of search in the same geographic region, they map that in a, in a medical heat map, which countries have access to, and your doctor could easily have access to as well. And Google does that all for free, by the way. Third thing your doctor could do is phone the place in your neighborhood where all disease starts. Do you know where that is? Yes, primary schools, specifically nursery schools. Those of you who have four, five, six-year-old children will know this. Those are disgusting human beings. <laughs> no, it's disgusting. They put anything into every hole, and then just green stuff comes out of all those holes again. I don't know how the whole, it's a complex adaptive system that is broken. Uh, but honestly, you will never be more sick than you are when your child first goes to school because they bring all of that disgusting filth home. Um, and your doctor should literally just phone the local nursery school every morning and say, what's on the menu today? <laughs> and of course, the th first thing your doctor knows is what's going around. Okay? Because your doctor knows what's going around. Because it's going into his reception area, which is where you've just sat for the last hour <laughs> and shared it with everybody else. Now, uh, I think you can see where I'm going with this. If your doctor had all of that information, again, not your doctor, a supercomputer in your doctor's office had all of that information, then maybe also had access to your diary and your movements. Your doctor could contact you and say, huh, Graham, I, I see you take a run every afternoon and you run past that primary school. Please don't. Okay, change your route. Secondly, I see you plan to go to those friends on Wednesday night. Uh, the Poppy Act doesn't allow me to give you more information, but cancel, cancel, don't go, not this week. Uh, and, and thirdly, you're not drinking enough water, you don't have enough vitamin D, do this, do that, and next week you won't be sick. Now, of course, you immediately are thinking, why would my doctor do that? Because my doctor's not going to get any money. You're absolutely right. So we have to change the whole system. Wouldn't it be remarkable if we paid our doctors every month we were healthy? That's a healthcare system. Get to the end of January, look back, hey, doc, 31 days illness-free, here's some money. Imagine the shift in customer service from your doctor if your doctor only got paid if you were well. No, really, imagine the change in the system. It would be remarkable. That is the invitation to reimagine a business. Here are some words you might want to use. We want to be proactive. We want to be predictive. We want to be preventative. We want to personalize. And we want to make sure that everybody participates so that we've got this benefit of the crowd in the system. Now, if business agility is about putting your customer at the center and building a business that is able to respond 
in an, in an agile way to what is happening in the industry, in the world, and in your customer's business, then those are not bad words to have in the back of your mind. To say, how do we become more proactive with our customers? How do we build a system inside our business that is not just, as Evan said earlier, is not just trying to flog what we're trying to sell to our customers, but is looking at the world from our customers' perspective. And, and I don't know, maybe your customers will have one or two other words in here that will help them. But this is the mindset. This is the mindset that we need. And we need to make sure that we are not merely attempting to do what we've always done, cheaper, better, faster. That's not business agility. If you get to the end of this year and you've implemented everything you've, you heard at this conference and all you've done is you've made your business slightly cheaper, better, or faster, you will not have understood the message of this conference. This conference is about reimagination about jumping into the future and seeing what's going to happen and all that's going to change and being prepared to completely reimagine every function and every part and every process of your business. Like Evan said, there isn't a roadmap. It's not that we can now tell you, here are seven things you do and it's all done. But if you take the model that he started with, which will be unpacked over the next two days, and if you take this mindset of reimagination, I think you can set yourself up to really think about your business in fundamentally new and different ways. The 2020s are now here. This is not the future anymore. We're in it. The greatest danger that we face is not the turbulence of the age that we live in, is not the craziness of this decade we're part of. The greatest danger we face right now is to use yesterday's logic for tomorrow's world. And the 2020s is an invitation to reimagine. Thank you. <laughs>